Uganda prepares to fight off an Ebola outbreak along the DRC border. In the spotlight, humanitarian and Miss Maryland International 2018, Therese Capange. And celebrating African-American visual culture and film in the U.S. Capitol. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. In our top story, Uganda is preparing to fight off Ebola along its border with the Democratic Republic of Congo. Officials there say they want to prevent an outbreak of the deadly virus, which has infected at least 250 people in the DRC since August. More than 180 have died. The border between the two countries remains open, but health experts are worried the, various, uh, the virus could enter Uganda through cross border border traffic. Halima Atumani is in the Ugandan town of Bundibujo for us with this report. The Lamia River marks the border between the Democratic Republic of Congo's Ebola-infected North Kivu province and Uganda. Despite the deadly viral outbreak, Uganda's health ministry says 20,000 people cross the border every week, putting the country at high risk. Ugandan Jen Bira goes to the DRC side at least twice a week to buy food and charcoal to sell back home. We have heard the disease is there, but we have to go out and trade. We're only a little scared because we've never seen anyone fall ill with Ebola where we go. We buy the merchandise and we leave. When Bira and others cross into Uganda, they get checked at screening points by healthcare workers and volunteers like Boaz Valimakao. So we have the hand washing, then uh, disinfecting the feet and screening, then we allow somebody to pass. While no Ebola cases have yet been detected in Uganda, it can take up to three weeks for symptoms to appear. The virus causes a severe hemorrhagic fever that kills at least half the people who become infected. Even with border screenings, Butoko Town Council Head John Kandore says they worry someone with Ebola could slip through. Somebody who is coming from Congo, we don't check with him with the hands. Once he comes to buy things, he buy and go. And the money, sometimes we have been fearing it to get. Uganda's health ministry is stepping up preventive measures by deploying an experimental Ebola vaccine for healthcare and frontline workers along the border. Currently, in Uganda, we have 2,100 doses of the vaccine available at the national medical stores, and preparations are in high gear, including training of health workers that are to be targeted. A 2007 Ebola outbreak in Uganda, in the border town of Wundibujo, infected 149 people, killed 37, and took several weeks to be contained. Halima Afmani for VA News, Wundibujo, Uganda. <laughs> But how to make medicines more affordable is a concern not just here in the United States, but throughout Africa and around the world. And the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Engineering Medicines for All Institute hopes to improve access to affordable, high-quality medicines. They say they aim, the aim is to lower the cost of medications as well as enhance the security of supply chains. The university now has plans to launch a new initiative in the Ivory Coast. Uh, viewers Mudibo Ndebele was at the event announcing the initiative and now joins me to tell us more. Uh, welcome, Mudibo. Thank you. So tell us first, uh, you know, how did uh, they end up having the Ivory Coast as a, a place that they are favored to have this initiative begin? Thank you very much uh, for having me on uh, this uh, table. I asked them, they say the first choice was Mali. Because of uh, the insecurity in Mali, that's why they end up to choose uh, Ivory Coast. Mm -hmm. And according to uh, the higher ministry of uh, education of Ivory Coast and scientific research, it is not in fact for Ivory Coast only. But this is only a pilot program in, for Ivory Coast, but the intent is really to provide lower and high quality medication for the entire continent. What is the motivation? What makes them want to do this? And as you may be aware of it, right now in Africa there is a lot of uh, many infectious disease. We talk about Ebola, we talk about AIDS. So, and we know like most of those 
drugs and medicine are manufactured in the Western countries, and it is not affordable for the layman African citizen. And uh, in order to counter these issues, they decided instead of manufacturing medicine outside of Africa, it's better to do it in, in within Africa. And I asked uh, one of uh, the top researchers of this program in terms of the quality of the medicine that they might have it. And they say right now they are really working to make sure that all the international standards should be met even though those medicines are manufactured in Africa. So in other words, uh, they are planning to produce like generic medicine because we know we have the big companies, the Pfizer's and others who are, are obviously producing very expensive medicine with uh, a label. Uh, so this is uh, to produce what, uh, generic medicine specifically to those markets? Yes, this one, as you say at the beginning of uh, your uh, interview, uh, VCU uh, medicine for uh, all works under the auspice of so the School of Engineering of Virginia Commonwealth University. The main goal is to manufacture essential medicine, especially medication, which to tackle disease, mainly infectious disease. As I say, we have malaria, mm -hmm. we have other disease, but the main goal is especially essential medicine. So there's this, they don't like researching to come up with anything new, but they're trying to make sure they can take the variations of what is existent and uh, package it and, you know, to kind of ship it to those uh, needy places. Is no. that the idea? Yeah. The main idea is to manufacture medicine in Africa. But in order to do that, the whole chain of supply, like the training of uh, the, uh, like a physician, and also they have oh. to come over here in the yeah. U.S. to get the proper so, oh, training. Great, great. That's the point, that they are manufacturing this medicine on the continent. Yes, on the not continent. Not manufacturing it here and shipping it over no. there. From point A until the point Z, everything will be done in Africa. But in order for that to happen, yeah. all the missing that should be, for instance, I ask them in terms of training or for the medical personnel. We know that in Africa, all the technicians, even though they might have the knowledge, sometimes yeah. they lack the tools. So therefore, VCU, especially the School of Engineering, that's why they signed on November 2nd an MOU, which is a Memorandum of Understanding, where they're going to define all the tools, because mm -hmm. now even themselves, they are not really so clear about all the tools and things they might need in order to make these things happen. But all those physicians will come over here in terms of training, mm -hmm. in terms of logistics, so to make this happen. I, for instance, I don't know if you know, Ivory Coast right now, in terms of like uh, illegal medicine, is killing millions of people. Yeah. And so this is yeah. a chance that people should really have like affordable and high quality meeting international content. standard medicine Great. from Africa. Thank you very much, Modibo, for coming Thank you. and sharing this with us. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Well, that's our uh, viewers, Modibo and Dembele. Now back to the continent, moving to Ethiopia, where police say they have uncovered a mass grave on the border between Strife, Torn, Oromia and Somali regions. Local media says at least 200 bodies were found during an investigation into alleged atrocities committed by uh, the former president of Ethiopia's Somali region, Abdi Mohammed, uh, who is awaiting trial of allegations he fueled ethnic clashes. Rights groups accuse his administration of abuses such as torture. Witnesses claim he ordered paramilitary raids on civilians in neighboring Oromia province after ethnic clashes broke out in, uh, there in September. The region has been plagued by violence for decades as the government fought uh, the secessionist Oga the National Liberation Front. Both sides signed a peace deal last month. Election observers say Madagascar's presidential election this week had very minor irregularities, but nothing important enough to affect the results of the vote. President Harry Raja Onari Mampianina, who was running for a second term, had alleged the vote was marred by fraud. He complained about what he said was an invalid voter register, delays in opening of the polls in some places, intimidation and ballot stuffing. The president and his two predecessors are the three front runners in the first round. Uh, the top two are expected to face each other in a runoff next month. Uh, because of the unusually high number of ca uh, contestants, few expect in an outright winner. Uh, the poll is widely expected to go to a second round between the top two candidates on December the 19th. Now, the 2018 midterm election dominated the headlines this week and for good reason. The results of the vote ushered in a number of historic firsts. 
breaking ethnic and gender barriers. The new U.S. Congress, set to take effect in January, will be the most diverse in American history. But as viewers Brian Pardon reports, the growing diversity of legislators is primarily taking place in the Democratic Party, a sign that many women and minority voters are turning away from President Donald Trump and the Republican Party. For the first time in history, two Muslim women were elected to the U.S. Congress. Ilhan Omar, who came to Minnesota as a Somali refugee, says her election is a repudiation of President Trump's travel ban on predominantly Muslim countries. In a time when um, Somalis are on uh, the Muslim ban, um, to be sending a Somali refugee uh, to Congress, Minnesota is sending a clear message. Rashida Tlaib from Michigan is also a strong critic of the president's restrictive immigration policies. And I want to change the world, and this is what I'm doing. And uh, yeah, it, it so happens that I'm going to be doing it as a member of Congress. Two Native American women were also elected to Congress for the first time. At 29 years old, New Yorker Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, whose mother is Puerto Rican, is the youngest woman elected to Congress. That's exactly what this is. Not a campaign or an election day, but a movement, a larger movement for social, economic, and racial justice in the United States of America. And in California, Republican Young Kim, who distanced herself from Trump's policies, could become the first Korean-American woman in Congress if her slim electoral lead is confirmed. The more diverse Congress reflects in part the increased involvement of many ethnic minority groups that are reacting to President Trump's anti-immigrant policies. And Democrats in particular really saw the benefit of that yesterday because Democrats had more of those diverse candidates and they were successful. Democrats hope the growing diversity of the electorate will in time shift the balance of power in Washington in their favor. Brian Patton, VOA News, Washington. Want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover? Share the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Still I am on Africa 54, telling the story of African Americans in film. But first, a look at Friday's headlines. Ce que nous avons constaté comme difficulté et anomalie, c'est des questions plutôt dans de logique. Therese Capenge is half Angolan and Togolese, based in Baltimore, Maryland. She is a medical assistant, soon to become a medical doctor. As if that's not enough, she also runs the Therese Capenge Foundation, a nonprofit organization that helps empower, motivate, and encourage young adults. She is the pageant coordinator for Miss Ebony World and just so happens to be Miss Maryland International 2018. Therese jo uh, Capenge joins me in studio to tell us more about that. Welcome to Africa 54. Well, thank you for having you me. See, I, you know, uh, 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 my colleague asked me, what else doesn't she do? <laughs> you, you almost everything, right? Welcome to Africa 54. Thank you. And uh, congratulations for being Miss Maryland uh, International 2018. Thank you. When did you get crowned? Actually, it happened in June. Okay. This, yeah. So you're so, reigning yes. queen until when? <laughs> until March, actually. Okay. I have to crown new queen yeah. in March. Okay. So, so uh, how did you take interest in this, in being uh, um, a queen, being uh, this? Because I cannot. <laughs> actually, I wasn't expecting it. Yeah. I, 
I, I was Miss Baltimore, yeah. and I was the title, the local title holder, yeah. and I had to compete for the state title, and it's the grace of God for mm. me to win Miss Maryland International, because there's so many beautiful young women out there, but I was privileged enough for the judges to pick me to be Miss Maryland International mm. 2018. Now, right now, sometimes people think when you become Miss somebody international, Miss Maryland International, you walk around just, uh, you know, showing off your beauty and telling people I'm the most beautiful. No. What are you doing with this? What does this mean to you? Well, actually, the pageant system, it's not always about the beauty. It's about in, get, uh, showing yourself in the community, doing something, show, actually talk about your platform. Mm -hmm. My platform is to empower young adults to know their values and say no to negativity. It is through personal experience where I felt like I wasn't beautiful. It came to a time where I felt like I wasn't beautiful. I had a like self, uh, low self-esteem mm -hmm. and I, I was very, I was speaking negativity over myself. Yeah. It came to a point where I had to change my mind. I had to change the way I was thinking and I started speaking positivity over my life. And mm -hmm. I, I realized that young women, they tend to speak negativity. They want to be somebody else. Yeah. And for me, I had to be that role model to remind them that yeah, they right. are beautiful and they but can overcome. Perhaps I should start telling myself that maybe I'm handsome. I don't know. <laughs> no, you have to speak <laughs> negative. You have to speak positivity Positive over it. To yes. myself. Yes. Now, how do you do this? How do you inspire the girls? How do you help these young adults to have this confidence in what they have and all the gifts they have. So I'm uh, the pageant coordinator for Miss Ebony World, which will take place in in June uh, to, uh, 29th, 29th. And my goal is to mentor them. So I ha we have the girls and we empower them before they come to compete. They had to come together and they had to share their personal stories. And I have to share my personal stories as well. And the goal is to let the girls know they are beautiful. It's not always about uh, phys uh, physical beauty, it's about whatever you do for the community, whatever you desire to do, it's also a beauty. So you have to be able to change your mindset, like I was mm -hmm. saying, and speak positivity. Mm -hmm. A lot of time people go through bullying and they, and they felt they received that negativity because they haven't changed their mindset. And would you say that uh, most people are actually beautiful? Mm -hmm. It's only what maybe somebody makes them think. But, exactly. Uh, you because they beautiful. don't know themselves. Yeah. You see, and when you know yourself, well, regardless of anything that people will say over you, especially verbally abused, I was verbally abused as well. Mm. But it came to a point when you change, everything starts with the mind. When you are able to shift your mind into positivity, you can yeah. overcome any sort of abuses. And it's not just having confidence about your looks, but also it's what you can achieve in life, Exactly, right? yeah. And that's what you're trying to tell them. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we hope you touch a number of uh, the girls out there, and even boys. And so we congratulate you for thank you for being Miss Maryland uh, International 2018, and also for the work you do. Uh, thank you Appreciate very much. It. Thank you. Well, that uh, uh, Therese Capenge is Miss Maryland International 2018. Well, it was a cinematic experience to remember. The National Museum of African American History and Culture hosted its first ever film festival. Viewers Maxim Maskalkov takes us inside the stories of African Americans who crafted possibilities in a world that often denied them opportunities. Esther the Ewart narrates. Barry Jenkins' new film, If Bill Street Could Talk, was the highlight of the museum's festival. The Oscar winner brought to the big screen this James Baldwin novel about racial discrimination and intolerance in 1974 Harlem. In this story about a young couple struggling against racist police and false accusations of rape, Jenkins says there are many contemporary themes. So many things that Mr. Baldwin was writing about in the novel that I think are still relevant today. You know, unfortunately so, in a certain way. We've made a lot of progress, but not complete progress. Um, I think mass incarceration is something that's dealt with in this film. It's a problem that it, that's gotten, to be honest, even worse um, since the time this, this movie was set. It's a project, Jenkins says, he was drawn to following the success of Moonlight for which he won an Academy Award for Best Screenplay. Before making Moonlight, um, maybe I wasn't sure that making films could change the world or change someone's perspective. Um, and I think after making that film and encountering people like yourself who say such nice things um, and who were able to see themselves in the work, I think it's just proof positive. 
Regina King stars as the mother of the would-be bride in If Bill Streets Could Talk. It makes me feel blessed that uh, the universe trusted me to be um, one of the many um, uh, black women to um, have an impact on um, young uh, black girl, black women. Canadian actor Stephen James portrays the young man falsely accused of rape. Oh, just an incredible experience to be part of a film like this um, with a filmmaker like Barry Jenkins. Um, he's a true auteur, you know, he's bigger than a director. And, um, and for me, you know, just being able to retell a Baldwin story. In addition to the Jenkins movie, the film festival at the National Museum of African American History and Culture included King T'Challa's costume from the Marvel blockbuster Black Panther. Curator Rhea Combs says there's no minimizing the cultural significance of a box office success where all the superheroes are played by African American actors. It was within that context that I felt like what we need to collect this object. You know, it speaks about empowerment. This object symbolizes resilience. It re symbolizes African American pride and identity. And all of those things are um, sort of paramount. The festival celebrated not only contemporary works and bright emerging directors, but also historic films, including feature director Charles Burnett and documentary filmmaker Madeleine Anderson. Well, that story produced by VOA's Maxim Moskalkov. Welcome back to Africa 54 and here's what's trending. Founded in 2013, Cameroonian uh, developer Kuros Games has grown to become Central Africa's first major video game studio. It draws on African mythology rather than Hollywood for inspiration, as in its fantasy role-playing game Orion, legacy of the Coriolan. Unlike neighboring states, Cameroon has been relatively stable for decades, but it's blighted by poor infrastructure and lacks the vibrant startup scene found in countries like Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. The company has broken down barriers in education, with its game designers managing the, uh, to acquire expertise despite a lack of specialized training in Cameroon. Well, next up, Samsung unveiled its much-anticipated uh, foldable phone to developers in San Francisco, urging Android programmers to start writing apps for the product, which does not yet have a launch date. Samsung also launched a new flexible mobile screen technology for its flo uh, foldable phones called Infinity Flex Display. Foldable phones hold the promise of allowing consumers to do more complex work uh, that would normally be uh, done on a tablet or laptop, but with a device that becomes far more compact. The goal is uh, garnering critical feedback as new technologies will require developers to tweak apps to make sure they run smoothly when the phone folds out into tablet form. And that's what's trending today. Now, January will mark the 60th anniversary of the founding of Motown Records. The Detroit-based company became world famous for its di uh, distinct sound and star performers such as Michael Jackson, Diana Rose, Marvin Gaye, and numerous others. Motown Records topped the records charts during the 1960s. Its success continued for more than a decade later. Motown Records was sold in 1994 and now operates under a parent company. But the name has become a symbol of an important era in American music. VOA's Slide It's a Hoax reports on Detroit's efforts to build its legacy as a Motown city. Detroit is making efforts to recover from years of economic decline and reminding people of the city's music heritage is a large part of it. Detroit's main library provides space for local musicians to breathe new life into half a century old Motown classics. Abdul Duke Fakir is an original member of the Four Tops. There's got to be some kind of way that, uh, that the Motown story and music can stay alive in Detroit. I mean, we were just as important to Detroit as cars. One of the leaders of the crusade to revive the Motown genre, a blend of soul and pop, is singer Joan Belgrave, the widow of star trumpet player Marcus Belgrave. There's no place that's dedicated to that genre. And this is Detroit, and people are so shocked, honestly. 
The Motown Museum in Detroit displays photographs from the company's golden era and is planning a major expansion. Some of the city's streets are getting named after famous Motown stars such as Michael Jackson. And there is an effort to build a nightclub industry centered around the Motown sound. One of the company's greatest stars was Washington-born Marvin Gaye. His fans say his music resonates today as much as it did 40 years ago. The more spiritual part of Marvin is that which I've clung to the most. What's going on, um, inner city blues. Um, so as I'm listening to the song right now, I'm thinking about all the things that's happening in the world, that's happening in this country right now. And he was talking about it then and is relevant now. When Barry Gordy founded Motown Records in January of 1959, he had no idea that he would become a celebrity himself. His autobiography was the basis for Motown the Musical that hit Broadway in 2013 and London two years later. I wanted to tell the story of what Motown was all about. Yeah. I wanted to tell the story of how it felt, you know, the wins and the losses and triumphs and the disasters that happened along the way and how it was that I happen to come up with it. The West End musical is currently on a year-long tour of Britain and Ireland. Gordy says he set out to make good music, not just for black people, but for the whole world. Detroit wants to remind the world where it all started. Zlatica Hoke, VOA News, Washington. Well, and we end our show today with the Ghanaian artist, Wayo, featuring Joy B in his new music video, Muscatella. From all of us here in Washington, have a great weekend. Friday night, I'm wasted. The night feels amazing. The boy needs to wind down. I don't need the basics. I see a fine booty. Excuse me, no need to be rude. You seem lonely, you coolie. You don't have to be moody. You're sweetie like Muscatella. Tell me why would you cheer up? Wonderful kind, I'm wonderful kind It takes two to enjoy I see you like movie or hips so Mr. Kuvi, Mobito She waste my time, I don't mind All I need is your name and your number I drink it, she drink it, we get it so naughty Next thing I know, she they feel on my body As long as she's with it, there's no need to worry She cool and I'm cool, but I'm feeling some more heat Sweetie like Muscatella, she's got a wicked flavor. Sweetie like Muscatella, she's got me spending change. Sweetie like Muscatella, she's got a wicked flavor. Sweetie like Muscatella, oh God, she all I see. Wake up, wake up, let's roll. Let's make this here a party. This go invasion naughty. Who? I'm from the 80s, money, huh? I can't deny there's something. Fishing for you is gravy. I think I caught me something. Oh, go, go way up into the heavens. Winds got us high, dancing with. Welcome to English in a Minute. When you slip, you fall Ouch. down. But how does something slip from your mind? Slip one's mind. Let's listen to Anna and Jonathan. Look at this beautiful cake I made for the dinner party. Oh no, is that tonight? Yes, didn't you make something? No, it totally slipped.